Hello, everybody. Welcome to Death and Dying. It's an odd thing to say, isn't it? So, within geriatrics, I think it's important to discuss death and dying, end of life processes, because the vast majority of patients you'll be working with in geriatrics, especially if you're in long term care of some sort, is going to be that they die. I mean, you could you could take the philosophical route and say that we're all going to. And true enough, as far as I know, there's no vaccination against death at this point. But this will happen with a lot of your patients eventually. Um, and it's challenging for everyone, obviously, the patient, the family, but also the care team. Few people are in healthcare are really trained to help patients die well or are prepared for what it's going to be like. And remember, remember what I said earlier, right? What do, what do we say to the God of death? Not today. That's healthcare slogan, really. And we, we're just not prepared for that. Now we can be, they've done some studies on this. Sadly, we're in a time when this is pretty prevalent. Um, and they have found that a lot of patients dying does wear on a healthcare team quite a bit, but also that they can be prepared for it and have better outcomes. Um, so there are phases in death and dying. Now, this is assuming a natural death. This is not assuming that they're dying from a disease or they got hit by a bus or something like that. This is a, a natural disease progression. And with, during this progression, your role changes um, significantly, actually. So we never discuss the phases of dying and what happens, what, what your job is in, during those phases. Quick reminder again, uh, the first phase, you could argue, is the terminal diagnosis. Again, remember, this is six months or less that a patient has to live. Um, and while people have pointed out in the past that the last six months are usually the most medical, like medical intensive, and I said first, didn't I? I'm sorry, the last six months are the most medically intensive and expensive ones. The other truth of the matter is you generally don't know you're in the last six until pretty close to the end. You know, most of the of that time, you won't really have any idea that this person's the sands in their hourglass are running out. There are no distinct signs or symptoms to look for in this. The second stage is the rather dumbly named preactive phase. I think I think it's a dumb name. Um, it just uh, sounds silly. And uh, this usually, uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of stuttering there. This usually goes one to four weeks. Very much depends on the individual, though. It can go a lot longer than that. Some people just kind of skip over this. The uh, signs and symptoms of this are increased restlessness and anxiety. Um, and this is kind of a formless anxiety. They don't really have a reason that they're anxious. They just are and that they're, they're restless. Uh, they also will sleep more, and this is related to the body beginning to slow processes down. Um, again, you'll see them sleep more often, they'll take naps, they'll doze off at times if they're doing something quietly. They also have a decreased intake of food and drink, and this is for the same reason. Their metabolism is slowing down, you know, it's, it's, things are coming to a stop. They begin to see people who have died. Uh, this can either be in the form of a hallucination or it can be in a dream, but it's generally people that have died before them and who they want to see again, who they miss. Um, so, you know, this is believed to be kind of a comfort measure that the body produces for itself. And also they get very concerned about unfinished business um, of all types. Their literal business, if they, if they had a business, they, they get concerned about what's going to happen to that, even if they haven't worked there in you know decades. 
uh, they get concerned about fi family finances and what's going to happen with the family when they're gone. And they get really concerned about unfinished personal business. Uh, maybe they want to reconnect to a friend they haven't talked to in a long time. Maybe they want to resolve an issue that people you know, that they've allowed to fester. Uh, we all have that. We haven't talked to this person in a long, long time. And now this, because we got mad at them, and now they want to make it right in the time they have. They don't necessarily know that this is what they're thinking, but that, you know, that they're, they're not necessarily aware that their time is running out, but they have that feeling that they want to get these things done. The active phase is when you're, is when the body is really starting to shut down at this point. They have, uh, patients may have vivid, detailed hallucinations. I mean, so much so that they may not be aware that you're in the room. They may be having conversations with somebody else over there and they don't even re recognize that you're there. Um, a refusal of food or drink, and this is, that sounds like they're like, no, get that away from me. And there are some people that do that, but normally this is just like more of a lack of interest. They just don't feel hungry. They don't, food doesn't sound good to them. They don't feel thirsty. Um, and typically once you're at this point, uh, when a patient's at this point, we don't encourage them to eat anymore. We'll discuss that more in a little bit. They'll start to develop cyanosis, you know, which is a bluing of the skin, especially in the lips, the ears. Uh, their ears will open, and this is kind of hard to show, but you know, uh, it's because of the muscles back here. Boop, boop. They're starting to relax, and it's starting to let the ears kind of collapse forward. They can't really do that well, but you'll start seeing them kind of push forward. They also will often develop Kennedy ulcers, and Kennedy ulcers are usually within 48 hours of somebody dying or less, they'll start to develop these. These are kind of like pressure ulcers. They don't think they're pressure ulcers in the same way as what the ones we talked about earlier are. This is, most people believe, related to, um, I, I'll get one more, we don't really understand the mechanics of this while, while I've got the chance, but the, the theory is that this is the, you know, your skin's an organ. Your organs are shutting down at this point. If the, if the patient is actively dying, their organs are shutting down. This is the skin dying and just losing its integrity and its cohesion. Uh, it looks, it always forms in the sacral area. They're always in the same spot. So the small of the back, I'm pointing to it like you can see it. And they tend to look, have like a butterfly shape to them. And listen, these are very, very distinctive, and they open very, very quickly. Um, saying goodbye is something that you'll see oftentimes. And if you're working in long-term care, you'll get to know a lot of the of the patients or residents that you're taught that you work with. And so, I mean, saying goodbye is fairly normal. You'll pass by someone and go, "Hey, see you tomorrow." Um, what I mean is something like a real heartfelt goodbye or I have had people tell me I'll say I'll see you in the morning and they'll say no you won't and they're often pretty accurate about that so if someone is really saying goodbye this is a time when within the facilities you know our, our ears perk up and we go uh oh um, and the last one often that we see is um, we call it light bulb syndrome I I don't know that there's actually a term for this. I have not found one. But what happens is that someone has been lethargic and not eating and sleeping all the time, and suddenly they just come to, they just flare up and they go out in this glorious burst of energy and they feel fantastic and they're eating and they're involved in activities and they're talking to people and then they suddenly expire. Yeah, this goes on for a couple of days, and then, then they just go. Um, don't know what causes that, but I've seen it often. Here's some fun reading for you. And very quickly, let's talk about uh, food's cultural significance. Now, it is important to recognize 
that I am approaching this from a Western American point of view, right? And that everybody's culture and experiences will be different and how they perceive the dying process will be molded by their culture. But I would be I would put money on it that there isn't a culture in the world that doesn't have in which food does not have cultural significance. Uh, it often represents uh, healing and health. You know, food is food is medicine. You give somebody chicken soup when they feel sick. Um, when I was growing up, I would if I felt sick, my mother would get me ginger ale and saltines to nibble on, and I still do that today. So these things stick with you for a long time. We we also use food to mark cultural milestones. Um, any kind of important event, you know, a, a wedding, a birthday, uh, a holiday, all of these things have food involved in them. And more, more personal cultural milestones. I bet you money that your first date was to a dinner somewhere or drinks or something like that. I bet you met your special someone over a dinner date somewhere, something like that. It's how we mark things and sharing food with people is how we get closer to them. It also is indicative of caring and family. Remember again, the what, Thanksgiving, but that's a, we get all the family together, we have a big meal. Um, food is just central to a large part of that. And watching somebody who is uh, in their eyes, wasting away and not eating, the family is going to want to feed them. And honestly, at that point, you need to step in and explain to them that trying to encourage them to eat is not helpful and can be detrimental. And we'll go into more of that. Now, because nutritionally, um, protein and energy needs are decreasing rapidly. You know, the metabolism is slowing down. Cells are not being repel repaired or replaced at this point. 80% of patients in an active phase report anorexia, so they have no interest in eating or drinking. And many of them experience cachexia, which, remember, is a rapid loss of lean body mass. And also remember that cachexia can't be resolved by nutrition alone. It's related to a some other condition going on with the patient that's causing the cachexia. And to stop the cachexia, you have to resolve the underlying issue. The underlying issue in this case is that they're dying and there is no way to resolve that. So this is cachexia that can't be reversed. Um, and then finally, as a dietitian, you're going to, your instinct is going to be, as this person is not eating anymore, to do some sort of um, enteral or parenteral nutrition for them. And that's not, that's not supported by the American Gerontology Society, uh, by the Academy, or by Aspen. In fact, doing that, encouraging people to eat when they don't want to at the end of life can cause physical discomfort. Um, you know, because their body's not their metabolism, the blah, metabolism slowing down, their body's not processing things anymore. It doesn't run through in a natural or fast manner. It can make them feel nauseated. It can make them throw up. Um, there's also no changes in mortality in uh, versus like an enteral nutrition versus hand-fed patients. There's it doesn't change anything. There's some evidence that physical signs and symptoms improve, but quality of life indicators don't improve. Um, so you know, there's very little reason to do that. Hydration is often per request. We'll, we will leave fluids in the room with them, you know, some water or some juice or something for that. And we might come by and ask them if they want a drink, but we don't say, have, have a drink for me, try this. Um, again, 
pushing it on somebody at this point is really inappropriate. So um, your role in this uh, is, you know, obviously there are no clear needs estimations for terminal patients. MNT is no longer a concern because why? What are we trying to do with this? Um, nutrition support is maintained if the patient desires it. So if they want to eat, feed them. If they don't, don't. Typically, again, kind of like the fluid uh, in my facilities, what we'll do is either ask them if they'd like a plate or bring one by and see if they're interested because if it's something they like and they might want to eat it, great. Um, they're, but you're, they're never encouraged. To eat. You don't encourage someone at end of life to eat. You just offer them the food. Um, and again, it's only for pleasure, only because they want it. And again, it's worth re repeating that you can cause someone physical discomfort at end of life if you're trying to get them to eat and they don't want to. And it's also important to um, educate family and staff. Uh, they are going, you, the family especially, but also the staff, staff is not used to seeing this, is going to want to feed them. Again, remember, food is healing, food is medicine. And they're watching their loved one waste away in front of them and seeing them not eat. So they're going to try to get them to eat. And it is really impressive what a family member can get somebody to do in a situation like that. Even if they have no desire to do it at all, they'll do it for, you know, mom will do it for their for her daughter just because she's asking her to. So it's important to educate them as to what's going on and say, you know, this can cause them to be, this can cause them discomfort. And it's important to clarify for them that the patient is not dying because they're not eating. They're not eating because they're dying. And that can be a very hard thing for people to deal with. Remember again, food is very culturally symbolic. It represents family, friends, health. And their hearts are in the right place. They really want to help. They really want to do something. And there's just nothing to be done at this point. The best thing to do is just to be there with them and allow them allow them the opportunity to eat, but don't encourage them to do so. All right, guys, that is end of life. If you have questions or concerns, hit me up, let me know. Uh, and I will see you again when we talk about the grieving process. All right, talk to you later. Bye.